And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to welcome all of you once again into the Puritan Barn to the Now You See TV studios for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, uncovering Atlantis, one of my favorite subjects, Atlantis. And tonight, John has some material that I guarantee is going to blow your mind. I don't care how much you've studied or looked at Atlantis. This is going to be frosty. I guarantee you. So get ready. It all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? It's so good to be here again in the Puritan Bar with David Carrico bringing you guys the midnight ride. I mean, this is the highlight of my week, and we appreciate you guys sharing that with us. You guys could be literally doing anything you want right now, but you're here with us and we just were so excited and we were thankful for it let us know where you're from in the chat and uh, we would love to hear it david how's your week been it's been fantastic it's just been great we're just so thankful for everything the lord's done and uh just just thankful just thankful yeah man it's it's been uh it's pretty amazing to walk his path and basically walking by faith not by sight because none of this can ever be foreseen the kind of things that he has in mind for those that do his bidding right it's just pretty amazing so with that being said guys i want to give a shout out to our sponsors tonight um tonight we're going to give a shout out to fojc radio uh this is david and donna's minist- uh, ministerial content that they've been doing for over uh, 40 years all put in together on one website and you can check it out there, there are lots of resources fojcradio.com uh, also sugar and spice soap.com sugar and spice soap company.com um they have natural soaps that are just amazing beautifully made wonderful for gifts wonderful for your own uh place also just um the fact that you can put stuff on your body without having to worry about harmful chemicals being added to those things uh not having to worry about pig lard or anything like that depending on who you are i know for me this is a huge thing for my family and so um having them as a a sponsor is awesome you can check it out they have midnight ride soap just for you guys out there uh, midnight right package and anything you do order on there uh, use the coupon code nystv and that'll get you 10 percent off any order that you do also we want to give a sh- big shout out to watts leather um, making some amazing custom pieces for for leather also he has other pieces on his website too that are really cool that you can check out but pretty much whatever you can think of uh, to have done he can do it he's made amazing book covers for me for books that are pretty rare that i that I uh, don't want to lose. He's made these covers that he can put um, over the top of these covers that make it look like they come out of an ancient library. Just amazing stuff. Uh, Really fantastic work. So check them out. Also, nystv.org, which is our website that has amazing content that you cannot find anywhere else. Documentaries you can't find anywhere else. The Book of Enoch video commentary that uh, myself and David are going through. David's leading us through the entire Book of Enoch uh, in it is all right there and there's other stuff that's been banned from YouTube that you can check out there So we uh, check that out. You use the code writer It'll get you eight dollars and ninety nine cents off your first month all the links to that are in the description uh, Also a couple announcements that I want to make and then David I'll hand you the floor to make an announcement um, in uh, Florida uh, in Estero, Florida, which is Southwest Florida around that area. We're having a meet-and-greet and uh, I'm going to be there. Uh, nobody else from the team is going to be there to this one, but it'll be in Estero, and it's on the 25th of January. So the end of this month, I will be there. 
uh, you can register for that. I, um, I don't have the links in the description right now, but I can put the links in a comment for those of you that would like to come and check it out. It's absolutely free, but I'd love to meet you guys. It's also a great way if you're in the area to meet people from your area that you can connect with that are similar minded in that area. We're also going to be doing one in Nashville uh, the following month. So make sure you guys stay tuned for those, that information. Cause we'd love to meet you. The one in Nashville, it's going to be oh, the whole team there. It's going to be really cool. Uh, and the one in Florida, I'm just really looking forward to it. There's people down there that we've never been that far South to, to meet. And I'm just totally excited about it. Also breaking Babylon coming up tomorrow night on breaking Babylon, YouTube channel, another live show, uh, going on at 6 PM central time. And David, you have a, also on FOJC radio, there's a show going on, uh, to tomorrow night as well, right? Yeah. After Breaking Babylon at 6, at 8 p.m. Central Time, you can go to FOJCRadio.com. There's a link there to our Rumble channel, and we're going to have a live video stream of Scratching the Hollow, Scratching the Surface of the Hollow Earth with Tracy Vinay. It is going to be good. I mean, it is just really uh, some amazing stuff. So we're just thankful, and uh, join us for that. Yeah, man. Any other announcements before we get started on this? This is in this rabbit hole into the Atlantis underground. Let's get after it. All right, let's do it. So uh, tonight, this show is, is talking about Atlantis Uncovered. Now, I was speaking to a friend of mine on the phone, and he's he was saying, look, man, there's this information. You have to check it out. There's this video. You need to look at it and see this because this is interesting when it comes to Atlantis. It, this is a possible location. It looks really uh, possible that this is it. Now, Atlantis is one of these uh, interesting subjects that spoken about originally by Plato. Plato and Plato's, I guess it was called the New Republic or the Republic. I can't remember. Uh, what is the name of that uh, book, David? The, um, um, Plato's Republic? Critias. Uh, Critias. Critias and, and Timaeus. Critias and Timaeus. And in that book, he describes a city that he heard about secondhand. And in this city, it describes uh, a city that never sleeps, a city that is constantly with commerce all the time. You know, it's not too far from the Pillars of Hercules. It describes what it looks like and all of these different things. Now, from this story, many um, many things have been formed, many ideas, many things to look forward to for a civilization in the future. The ideas, even theosophy and different religions like that have integrated Atlantis into their stories since this. And uh, the reason to me Atlantis is so intriguing is, is several reasons, but one of the reasons is the idea of the Ten Kingdoms of Atlantis, the Ten Kings of Atlantis, because in the Scripture we find a kingdom having ten kings that will return um, to face the world in combat, right? This is, this is going to happen in the end times, and it's intriguing to me that a lot of the similarities in Atlantis um, have the similarities of, of a pre-Diluvian world that existed um, with a certain type of government that we will see again. And it's pretty interesting to me. And I know, David, you said it's one of your favorite subjects as well. It is, and uh, we've done a lot of broadcasts. We've talked about the Ten Kings, and we've got it in Daniel 7, Revelation 17. There's the ten sections of America divided in uh, into the FEMA ten sections. It goes on and on and on. And this is the uh, origin of, of this whole 10 king scenario right here this is where it began it all stems from atlantis yeah even even francis bacon which um you know wrote a book called the new atlantis and in this book it, it's just basically idol like not kind of idol idolizing um i guess just lifting up the idea of atlantis and making a new civilization in comparison to yeah. the the beauty and the in the unification of this golden state or golden island i guess yeah. that they describe it as atlantis was the globalist utopia that the new world order aspires to now yeah and one thing that i'm sure that we'll get to too is you know in the in the theosophical society there's two ways of looking at it. there's like the old style theosoph theosophist and the new style theosophist theosophist but they both uh, share this idea of this seven root race um, theology, this idea of seven root races, our ideology, these ideas of seven root races that have existed throughout time, the Atlanteans being the root race that existed now before the present day root race, which is according to them, the Aryan root race. But interestingly, human anthropology, all of the terms for uh, our identity based on our race are based off of this idea of the seven root race um ideology which i th i find super interesting to me because the atlanteans the idea that they consider the atlanteans a different root race than the root race that we're in 
right now uh, says says some pretty interesting stuff to me. I mean, um, I, I don't. This, these are the people that run our world, you know, that believe these things. Yeah. So, uh, with that being said, there's a video that we're going to be checking out. It's called "The Lost Roman Map Has Atlantis at the Eye of the Sahara Africa." It's called the Rachat Structure. Now, um, you guys are going to watch this video. It's going to be really interesting to me. When I first saw the title of the video, I'm like, "There's, there's no way. This is just." This is ridiculous, right? It's not possible. It's in the middle of the Atlantic. It has to be. Uh, but when I watched this, it really was intriguing to me um, to what this all meant. And me and David are going to be, we're going to watch this video. It's like 20-something minutes, but we're going to be positive in between to make comments in between based on some of the information that we've learned over time about Atlantis too, just to kind of add to what is being said here. So uh, we're going to start this video check it out and we will see you guys in the chat and we will be back and forth to um, discuss this with you guys so here we go in this video i'm going to share several astonishing new details that have come to light involving the topic of the lost ancient city of atlantis and the eye of the sahara which in just the last few years has taken the internet by storm as this unbelievably bizarre structure just so happens to match a dozen of the most significant similarities to Plato's description of the famed lost capital city of Atlantis. But perhaps the only thing stranger than these striking comparisons is the fact that the Rishat structure itself remains a genuine scientific mystery that continues to confound scientists to this day, as this one-of-a-kind geological feature is like no other place found anywhere else on Earth and has remained essentially hidden and largely unknown within the remote Western Sahara Desert of Mauritania, which only makes its distinctive nature that much more curious when you consider that so few people have still never seen or heard of it before, even including the most curious and inquisitive minds around. But let me ask you this, Joe, real quick. When you saw my video, was that the very first time you had ever seen this thing yes. before? Yes, yeah. That's the thing. And that is the thing, because if nothing else, this extraordinarily unique anomaly should be included on the list of natural wonders of the world. But nevertheless, when you see the new lines of evidence that I'm going to share in this video, it will become exceedingly apparent that the fittingly named Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. And not only that, these new details will likely make those who previously thought that this site could not possibly be the location of Atlantis think again. So with all of that said, let me start off by sharing something particularly interesting. It is widely known that the ancient Romans were renowned for documenting everything, as the Caesars went to profound extent to accumulate knowledge and information from every location their vast empire ventured. So I have to admit that I was quite surprised to learn of someone by the name of Pomponius Maia, who was the Romans' first geographer dating back to some 2,000 years ago, and had created a sophisticated map of the known world at that time, titled The Habitable World of Pomponius Maia, something that up until recently I had never seen or heard of before. And real quick, let's not confuse this map with the ancient Greek historian Herodotus' map of the known world of 2,500 years ago, which I shared in one of my prior videos on this topic. A map that curiously listed Atlantes in the same location of the Rishat. However, the original source of this map is a bit of a mystery, as modern historians claim that Herodotus is not known to have ever created an actual map and have thus put its origins into question. So, putting that map aside, let's focus on this verifiably authentic 2,000-year-old map that has also annotated something very interesting in the Western Sahara Desert. First, notice that this map is oriented to the east in its original form, so let me go ahead and flip it to a north-south facing orientation so we can gain our bearing, and the features of Europe, West Asia, and North Africa become apparent. So let's now focus our attention to what is in the northwest region of the Sahara and observe what it annotates here. Atlantia, or Atlantia, which more or less appears as Atlanteans, and again, in the same geographical region of the Rishat structure, which, like I've shared in my prior videos, just so happens to coincidentally match so many precise details that Plato described of Atlantis, including that the capital city was famously said to be made up of concentric circles, specifically three rings of water and two of land, which correctly matches the Rishat with water in it, 
which it certainly did, as I will prove to you with hard scientific data in just a moment. But the circular ring city was also said to have an opening to the sea at the south, which not only matches the southerly opening of the Rishat anomaly, but it even has existing evidence of a flow of salt water that is still visible to this day, which, and again, I will prove with hard scientific evidence shortly. But Atlantis was also said to be surrounded by a large... All right, David, I'll pause it for you there. Okay, now, the visual there is just stunning. It's just absolutely stunning. And one of the objections uh, that people might have in their mind would be that desert's real dry. You know, how in the world could that have been flooded and submerged underwater? And Robert Schlock of Boston University has done a lot of research to me that's just absolutely convincing where he put forth his argument that the Sphinx has water erosion. Mm -hmm. And this is something that Graham Hancock, Nathaniel West, and all of the researchers into Egypt that aren't buying the party line have agreed that this is indeed legitimate. Another thing that I remember that uh, is evidence of an ancient cataclysm in this area, a little, I believe it would be to the north in the Sahara, in the Libyan part of the Sahara Desert, they found green glass. Mm. And for sand to be heated to the temperature to where it would turn green like this glass there, the scientist says it would take nuclear fission to do that. Wow. And there's gobs of this glass you can just go pick up in the Libyan area of the Sahara Desert. And a lot of scientists, they just say the only thing could have caused that would be a nuclear explosion. Interesting. So there is a lot of evidence that we've talked about on previous shows on ancient technology that would validate the possibility of what this fellow is saying as being true. Yeah, man, I, I, I just recently watched an interview with a guy named Graham Hancock, and I know you know who he oh, is, yeah. but mm -hmm. uh, most a lot of people are starting to know a little bit more about him. You know, of course, we've been reading his books for many years now, but he um, speaks uh, kind of a contrarian view to all of these structures that most people do, and it's not contrarian to what we believe no, about it, but uh -uh. it's contrarian to what most uh, evolutionist scientists and, and archaeologists would say actually existed on these on these planes. But, you know, the idea that this technology existed that's different than our technology is really uh, probably 100% accurate. I mean, you had a civilizations that existed for thousands of years. You look at our civilizations when we st actually started getting technology, and it, we haven't been really existing that long once our technology just started booming all of a sudden, right? And, and um, so he brought up the idea that if their technology went down maybe a different path, instead of using some of the energies that we use uh, now, they use different energies such as, you know, vibration energy or such as static electricity and all these different kinds of energies rather than lithium, rather than gasoline, rather than all that, their technology would be something we wouldn't even fully quite understand, yeah. uh, but yet would be uh, maybe as advanced or more advanced than what we actually have right now. So, yeah, yeah like the free energy concepts of Tesla. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So we'll continue this video here. Rectangular plane, which is another arguable similarity that extends for hundreds of miles on both sides of the Rishat. But furthermore, Atlantis was said to be made of black, red, and white color stones, which is another specifically unique similarity that matches the geological nature of the Rishat. And speaking of uniquely specific geological features, this next detail that I recently learned of blew me away, as there is English literature from the year 1851 on the preliminary treaties of resources of ancient Mauritania, which describes the country as having gold in considerable quantities and even specifically states, and I quote, that it is a well-authenticated fact that previous to the discovery of America, Europe was supplied to a great extent with gold from Mauritania. How have I never heard of this before? And get this, Mauritania was so rich in gold that several hundred years ago, a king by the name of Mansa Musa of the Mali Empire which was a region of Africa that includes modern day Mauritania, was said to have been the richest man in all of human history. So rich that he far exceeds the richest billionaires alive today. In fact, he owned gold mines which account for more than half of the world's supply of gold today. 
And by the way, something else you'll find interesting related to that 1851 Treaties of Ancient Mauritanian Resources is that it describes ancient Mauritania of having an abundance of elephant ivory, which is a significant detail considering that Atlantis was said to have numerous elephants on the island. And so it's worth mentioning that there is also existing cave art depicting elephants in the area around the Rishot as well, as I've shared previously. But I digress because another highly specific feature of Atlantis was that its center island was, was described as being geothermal in nature and that it was said to have hot springs as well as springs of cold, fresh water, which is a reason why some have dismissed the dry, barren Rishot structure as a possibility for Atlantis. So I imagine that many will find it very interesting to learn that there is a little known study of the Rishot structure dating back to the late 1990s, which describes the Rishot as being a hydrothermal complex. Well, hot springs themselves are the very definition of a hydrothermal anomaly. And the fact that there is an actual scientific study corroborating this uniquely specific characteristic is significant in itself because Although the Rishot may be a dry, barren place today, we must imagine what a different landscape this region was some 11 to 12,000 years ago at the time of Atlantis. And speaking of 11 to 12,000 years ago, this is the part in the video where things get crazier and will continue to do so through the rest of the video. Because another key aspect is that Atlantis was described as having impressive mountains to the north. So assuming that the cliffs of the Adra Highlands don't already meet that description, there is likewise a massive mountain chain to the north called the Atlas Mountains, which were aptly named after the first known king of Mauritania, who, get this, just so happens to share the same exact name of the very first king of Atlantis, who was also named Atlas. Gee, what a coincidence. But it only gets more bizarre from here, because not only was the city of Atlantis described as having mountains located to the north, but also said to have rivers. So get this. Recent scientific studies have confirmed an ancient river called the Taman Reset that flowed from the Atlas Mountains and winded some... Pause it for just a second. I wanted to talk about something here. It's interesting. They talk about Atlas and they talk about um, Poseidon and, and the idea that you know this was set up by these, these so-called deities of course we did a show talking about the return of the ancient gods how a lot of them were just men idolized years later as being gods but um in this area here it talks about someone like poseidon now in in when we did the show on the anunnaki which was a show that i i, I think a few weeks ago we did and we talked about this in their books there was a fish-like deity that came out of the water and kind of help produce these civilizations. And we have this similar story here in this area, which, you know, even leads me more to believe the idea, the theory that, you know, what we see post flood as far as Nephilim go might actually be hybrids, fish human hybrids that were able to survive. Because the Bible does say that all, hu uh, everything that breathed air white was wiped out on the earth. I, I, you know, that's one thing that very clearly in the King James Bible it says everything that breathed air was yeah. wiped out. But what about these hybrids that would have breathed, you know, water? They would have had used gills to consume that. They would have been left alive. So it's interesting. Nonetheless, what do you think about that, David? Well, it's amazing how this is going to dovetail into what I'll be talking about next week, which I'll, it just involves this concept of the hot springs. Yeah. And in the Book of Enoch, in the very next episode we'll be taping, the Book of Enoch claims that when angels are being punished he describes it they're basically being boiled in a mixture of molten metal and water and that that heats and it comes up to the surface as hot springs mm. and it talks about it even having healing capacity from the hot springs in places where um fallen angels were judged wow so it's actually if the book of enoch is credible and we believe that it is where there are hot springs it is possible that this has been a site of an ancient judgment of fallen angels where they're actually being punished so this uh, again this whole concept just you know he's just getting a little more credibility here as we go for this guy's argument 
Yeah, and you know, considering the possible timeline for when this place was, which they'll talk about a little bit in this video, I I, I thoroughly believe this is an antediluvian antediluvian civilization. You know, pre diluvian, the pre pre flood diluvian civilization um, that existed. It's so interesting to 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 see the remnant of what has been left behind because even the the pyramids could be much older than what we understand. Yeah. Um, today so. yeah another argument that graham hancock makes and this is agreed widely agreed to by a lot of researchers is that about eleven thousand bc that there was a major global cataclysm about eleven thousand bc yeah and that could very well be what we're looking at here very well could be all right we'll continue here 500 kilometers all the way to the atlantic ocean directly in the path of the eye of the Sahara. And if that isn't fascinating enough, just look at the date of when that river is known to have existed. 11,700 years ago, precisely within the time frame of when Atlantis was said to have been destroyed. Make no mistake, the entire region of the Sahara looked completely different at that time compared to what we see today. And the next few details that I'm gonna share may very well blow your mind. Because, like I've shared in multiple prior videos, there is tremendous evidence of vast water erosion throughout the Sahara Desert, which is so extreme that it can be clearly observed from space via satellite imagery. Make no mistake, this is not wind erosion, and has been confirmed to be catastrophic levels of water erosion by subject matter experts, including even the respected Randall Carlson himself. And the overwhelmingly apparent water striations that rip right through the Rishot structure all the way to the Atlantic Ocean are evident for all who have eyes to see. And upon further study, it looks as if an unimaginably massive force of water had blasted its way from the Mediterranean Sea through North Africa, creating a path that just so happens to be at all the lowest elevational points through the Sahara, just as water would naturally direct itself. And this is the part where things get really nuts, because there is a little known yet unbelievably fascinating scientific study that revealed a gigantic under ocean seafloor slide off the coast of Mauritania and is referred to as the Mauritanian slide and dates back to approximately 11,000 years ago, give or take, and was, get this, believed to have been created by a tsunami. A tsunami that given the very nature of its shape, would have originated from the east, as you can see from the debris field's widest point, and pushed westward to where the, the debris field eventually becomes more narrow. But not only that, this massive seafloor slide is located directly in front of the Rishot's path, as you can see from the reference locations on the study when compared to the respective locations on planet Earth. And when I say that this seafloor slide is massive, observe the legend in the lower right. From my own estimation, it is 300 kilometers or nearly 200 miles wide from east to west and nearly 150 kilometers or 100 miles wide when measured from north to south. To put that east-west measurement into perspective, the debris field generated by this tsunami is more than 25% wider than the maximum width of Florida's peninsula. Another comparison is that it's virtually the same distance from Washington, D.C. to New York City. So the big question becomes what on earth happened to send a biblical sized tsunami, so to speak, through North Africa in the approximate neighborhood of 11,000 years ago. And let's be real. If the Rishat structure is indeed the actual location for the lost city, the remains of it would be found in the area of this debris field, which by the way, is stacked layer of debris sediment and is at least a couple thousand meters or more than a mile deep. This entire area needs to be scanned with LIDAR and even drilled for examination. Now, let me keep going because this seafloor slide is not the only piece of evidence that suggests that the ocean bulldozed its way through the Sahara at the time of Atlantis, as the next detail I'm going to share is extremely significant. And I must first preface it by sharing a highly important detail that I've mentioned in prior videos, which is that the last time the Sahara was said to be under the ocean was at the time of the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which is estimated to have existed some 56 to 66 million years ago, essentially all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs. And you can distinguish the regions of the Sahara where this seaway is known to have once flowed, but here's the thing. 
You can also clearly observe that this seaway is not annotated to have went west over the wrist shot. Rather, it went south, which is why I suggest that something else happened, something separate and far more recently that has somehow eluded scientists and researchers. And here is the smoking gun evidence which proves it. Emikusi is the Sahara's largest volcano, reaching a height of 11,300 feet or more than 3,400 meters, and is dated to be 2 million years old. And the last known lava flow occurred at the south end of Emikusi's caldera in the neighborhood of 12,000 years ago, give or take. And this is the part that is unbelievably significant, because notice how the volcano is positioned directly along the clear path of catastrophic water erosion, just as we see as the wrist shot. You can literally see the line of the path that the water took and which clearly eroded and erased portions of that 12,000 year old lava flow, which means that the flooding would have had to have happened after that volcanic activity. Whether it be 12,000 years ago or 2 million years ago at the birth of this volcano, this is hard evidence that the ocean blasted its way through the Sahara far more recently than 56 to 66 million years ago that's been claimed. And the evidence does not stop there. Because this white blemish within Emikusi's caldera at 11,000 plus feet in elevation is not snow. It's salt. Salt that is said to be the remains of an ancient lake that disappeared just thousands of years ago. And not only that, small aquatic life, including gastropods, which consists of snails, slugs, limpets, uh, and other small little creatures, have been found within the caldera and have been... You know, it's interesting, David, all of these discoveries in the recent past and recent, just recently have lended to such an idea of the, the you know, the timeline being changed. You know, they step out, the, yeah. they tout these years off of millions and millions of years and have no idea what they're saying. You know, they just make up these numbers, but more and more, every evidence that we see points towards an earth that is not 50 something million years old, uh, points towards, you know, more recent times that all of these things happen. And, uh, you know, for instance, we were talking about the water line on the Sphinx. I was in Utah around the Moab area where people like to go four wheeler and Jeep riding and all that through there. And there's these mountains through there. And you can clearly see a line where water once existed in that area to where it was, you know, way high up thousands of feet over a mile high, you know, where water would have existed along the side of these mountain tops. And, um, it's, it's amazing how they, you know, the Smithsonian, the education system, how they so firmly stick to this narrative of evolution um, and do anything they can to hide the actual facts from this. You know, it, and I look at the mythologies, you know, you see, like we just talked about the fish man coming out of the water. Evolution's almost a humanistic idea of that, right? This, the fish coming to the water, turning into this, turning into that. And but we see this uh, this similar story mythology, but it involves uh, more of a genetic manipulation type scenario that we see in the Bible. And uh, the, the evidence just keeps coming out so much now, it's really hard for me to take seriously anybody that believes in these um, evolutionary ideas. Yeah. And it's so sad that what these educational, and that's a poor term to call them, institutions do... They get their scenario, and they get their timeline, and anything that does not fit with that is suppressed or ignored. Yeah. I mean, there's evidence, you know, it, there's no doubt that this area was at one time underwater. And yeah. just so much evidence in so many places that they will do everything they can to just disparage or cover up information that doesn't go along with the party line. It's just amazing. Yeah, and one of the, the subjects, like you're going to talk about next week on the Midnight Ride, some of the places that um, are proven to probably prove your point biblically, in Enoch, they've, they've shut down. You can't even go to these areas, right? You can't even look and explore them. And, and you see all of these these magazine or these uh, newspaper articles of giants found, right? Even Abraham Lincoln talking about these giants. Yeah. But all this, the bones are gone, right? The, somebody took the bones and just disappeared them, you know, out of the blue. And we have this um, this narrative being pushed down, and there's so much evidence of them pushing this down. Uh, it's amazing that the the masses haven't seen it yet, but it's right there in front of our faces. Yeah. So, anyways, let's continue here. But this is just more proof, you know, seeing this, seeing these uh, 
fossils being found in this area. It's just, there, it's hard to deny the existence, even if this isn't Atlantis, the existence of some civilization being there getting wiped out by a great tsunami of some sort. That's pretty interesting. Been radiocarbon dated to some 14 to 15,000 years ago. How did they get there and where did that salt come from? Because make no mistake, this salt water would obviously had to have come after this volcano's eruption, certainly not before. So let me now take you back to the Rishot structure so I can share one of the most significant details of this video, as it will prove that seawater was indeed inside the Rishot at the exact time of Atlantis. Just as I've shared in other videos, all these white blemishes are indeed salt. In fact, the entire region around the Rishot in Mauritania itself is known for vast amounts of salt that are mined and exported to this day. And when you consider that all the areas in and around the Rishot with these concentrations of salt also happen to be in the areas of the lowest elevation, it seems reasonable to conclude that seawater had once settled and evaporated here. And this next part is the smoking gun evidence, as I have found another little known study that shares how aquatic life, including mollusks, which by the way, examples of mollusks include oysters, clams, mussels, squid, and even octopus, existed in the brackish waters within the Rishot and have dates ranging from 15,000 to 7,700 years ago, which proves that the Rishot was consumed with water at the very time of when Atlantis was said to have been destroyed 11,600 years ago. Let that sink in for a moment as the implications are massive. And let me just say, if everything I've shared so far isn't compelling enough, wait until you hear these next several arguments. First, consider that the story of Atlantis actually originates from the ancient Egyptians who claimed that they were colonists and the remaining survivors of a civilization that was destroyed in a cataclysm. And this is where the legend of Atlantis comes from, which is something that most people are not aware of. And so when you consider this next remarkable fact that was only discovered not long ago is that the Sahara was a lush green tropical landscape at the time of Atlantis. And considering that Atlantis was said to be abundant in exotic fruits and vegetation and had lush hanging gardens, when you piece together the fact that the Sahara was a known lush tropical environment at that time only further adds to these possible similarities. And listen to this. The Green Sahara existed up until approximately 5,000 years ago when it shifted to the barren desert we know it for today. However, some estimates state that this transition may have happened as recently as 4,500 years ago, which is a curious time frame as it precisely coincides with the estimated date for when the pyramids of Giza were constructed some 4,500 years ago. And that brings me to another curious observation which is that the notable Egyptian Eye of Horus is uncannily similar to the Eye of the Sahara when observed from altitude. Of course, many will consider this comparison to be a stretch. However, it certainly has a thought-provoking resemblance, does it not? But that aside, and although the Sahara Desert initially seems like the least likely place that you'd find the lost city of Atlantis, it actually makes a lot of sense when you piece together other key details. For example, Atlantis was said to be busy all day and all night, rich in trade, and with people speaking languages from all over. So ask yourself, does it really make sense to suggest that a city so vastly consisting of travel and trade would be located in the middle? Interestingly, the, you know, David, just pausing up that part right there where it talks about it being a place with all different languages and, and all people was just basically hopping all night. This is the, the I guess... Um, the dream right this was the dream of, of of francis bacon this was the dream of the founders of our country for this to be the new spot that the whole world came to yeah all the time yeah yeah and uh i think that this it's amazing to me uh, honestly that, that plato just plato his his word on this place has just really spurred so much um study so much uh, archaeological research people have been searching for this place for hundreds of years you know based on a line out of plato's book that he had you know a paragraph yeah. it's yeah. pretty and uh plato was the man he had the sources um he talks about solon the egyptian priest that opened up to him the egyptian archives and also not long ago we were talking about on the uh, on the seven names of Solomon, how that it is believed that 
the lost writings of Solomon, some of them found their way to Aristotle and Plato. Mm. So Plato was very much in a position to know of what he spoke. No doubt about it. Of a vast, dangerous ocean. I mean, would other less advanced seafaring civilizations venture out to the middle of the ocean to hit up a local market to trade for ripe fruit, spices, and vegetables? Or is it far more likely that based on all the new scientific data that we have, that the region of North Africa, which we now know was connected by a diverse, massive network of rivers, which of course are conducive for travel, wouldn't that be more feasible? I mean, after all, new studies involving lost human civilizations of the Sahara have concluded exactly that. And something else worth mentioning is that Atlantis was an empire said to be made up of 10 kingdoms. And I would not be surprised if any of the other nine that made up this empire would be found in the island chains found in this region, including the submerged islands such as the Azores. I am simply focusing on the capital city, which was said to be made up of concentric circles. And the Eye of the Sahara is the one location that matches that highly specific characteristic and nearly a dozen others. Heck, even the names are still the same. Now, if everything I've shared so far isn't compelling enough, the next few details will hit the nail into the coffin that the Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. Because many have argued that since the Rishat structure is a, quote, natural formation, it could not possibly be the location since, after all, Atlantis was created by the god Poseidon. But when you consider that Poseidon was the god of the sea, water, horses, and earthquakes, the Greek word Poseidon itself translates to, quote, husband of the earth or lord of the earth. It seems to me that this is a lost in translation phrase that is meant to describe what we call today Mother Nature, which, if you ask me, would of course make the most sense. But besides that, we also know that humans have built upon the most unique natural formation since the beginning of time and still do to this day. Furthermore, people will also say that Plato stated that Atlantis was located, quote, west of the Pillars of Hercules, which we now know today as the Strait of Gibraltar, which is why many suggest that Atlantis would most likely be found in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. However, Plato did not say west. He actually said in front of. And the first thing you should know is that when you exit the Strait of Gibraltar, the current takes you directly south towards the Rishat. But furthermore, Assuming that a distant past civilization even had adequate seafaring vessels that could survive the open oceans, you had essentially three choices of travel when leaving the straits. You either follow the coast to the right, follow the coast to the left, or go straight into the unknown, endless ocean horizon at your own peril. So here is something interesting to think about. If you traveled along the coast with Africa to the left, you would journey west-southwest for more than 1,200 miles before rounding Africa's Western Sahara coastline. To put that distance into perspective, that is equivalent from New York City to Lincoln, Nebraska. That is no little trip. I, I point that out because it's not unreasonable to say that the Rishat structure is in front of the Straits when you travel by boat. But regardless, Plato never said west. And by the way, another detail people get caught up on it is that Plato stated that Atlantis sank beneath the waves, which is why many have long assumed that Atlantis would be at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. However, Plato also described that the destructed area of Atlantis following the cataclysm consisted of reeds of grass and that the area was no longer navigable by ship as it was blocked by a barrier of mud. Well, that does not indicate anything about being at the bottom of the ocean. Rather, he is essentially describing reed-filled salt marshes that are known to exist in shallow coastal regions. And although the Rishat is now some 1,200 feet above sea level, we know that that, of course, was not always the case, considering that the sea life once existed in the Rishat some 11 to 12,000 years ago. But you know, it's interesting. It talks about like a slide of land coming in. You know, we've we studied Tartaria, the mud flood idea, the the idea of this, and we've seen evidence that there have been these type things and cities yeah. built on top of cities. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting too. I, I want. I would love. I would give almost anything, uh, anything other than you know, like somebody I love, in order to be have the opportunity to spend. I don't know tons of uh, you know man hours and money digging in that area just to see what's there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. If I was a, a billionaire, I'd be financing some exploration there just yes. to find out. Sure would. No doubt. It, it, and, you know, all of this stuff is so intriguing. I, 
I wonder I wonder how much has been covered up of all this stuff. And I and I know that we've we've studied just more recent kind of history and the idea of a big cover up happening in our own country of of information covering up happening uh, through orphanage, through asylum asylums, through cover ups of uh, slides of land and all of that. And I just wonder how much of how much of this is going to show up this year. I mean, just so many things are showing up. It's just amazing to me. Yeah. And a, another thought, uh, the the fellow that's called the father of Egyptology, Athanasius Kircher, the yeah. Jesuit, and he's also responsible for creating some false timelines in Egyptian chronology, uh, according to Velikowski and others. But he drew the map that pictured Atlantis in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Could that have been for the purpose of misdirection? Possibly. To, because he certainly knew Egypt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's another possibility, a little misdirection there perhaps for the good Jesuit fellow. Oh, yeah. You can expect that from, from them, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. It's not too far-fetched, you know, that's for sure. So we'll continue here. This is why it is worth discussing the geological phenomenon known as isostatic response or glacial isostatic adjustment, which describes that when ice melts, the significant reduction in weight causes the land to lift back up, but subsequently causes land in other areas to decrease, which is the likely explanation for the sunken Azor Islands, as it's been suggested that the melted North American ice shelf caused that land to lift and subsequently caused the land in the Atlantic Ocean to sink. But if that is indeed the case, would that not potentially have caused North Africa to lift? I don't know, but another enthralling detail that goes along these lines is to note that the antipode of the Rishot structure today, and by the way, if you're not familiar, an antipode is a location that is directly opposite of another location on our globe. So get this. The antipode of Mauritania is Zealandia, a scientifically confirmed sunken continent that was only discovered in 2017. And considering that many have theorized that what happens on one side of the Earth could potentially affect the location directly on the other side, this detail is worthy of discussion. And by the way, let me give a quick shout out to my great friend Nikki of the Nikki Anna Jones YouTube podcast channel for sharing this highly thought-provoking detail with me definitely go to her channel and hit the subscribe button as she is completely awesome. Her personality and inquisitive mindset are infectious and I know that you'll just love her. Now one last final yet important argument to be made related to the Rishot Atlantis theory is that many will say that the measurements provided by Plato for the size of the capital city make the Rishot far too large. However, I disagree and would argue that the true measurements would surely have been lost in translation over the course of some 12,000 years and through the numerous changes of language that would have of course occurred during the passing of that prolonged time. I mean, it's not like anyone today speaks Latin, which was once a common language, and heck, even the modern English language itself is only 500 years old and derives from Old English, which is quite a bit different, and in that in itself is only 1,500 years old. Make no mistake, languages are constantly changing and keeping up with measurements, I would argue, could be a very difficult challenge, especially over 12,000 years. And Solon went out of his way to describe this issue of interpretation when he stated that he would endeavor to the best of his ability to describe the specifics of Atlantis. And considering that Atlantis was said to be busy all day and all night, it's fair to say that the local population would have had to have been in the millions just as we find in other busy cities throughout the world today. So the city of Atlantis would have had to have been large enough to inhabit a sizable population. I mean, let's note that modern metropolitan areas are very comparable to the size of the Rishot. For example, the Paris metro area is well over 20 miles from one side to the other. And the same can be said for modern day Cairo. The reality is that lost in translation is a very real thing because even the ancient Greek word used by Plato to use and describe the word island of Atlantis was the word Nessos, which when you research the origins of that word, you find that it has five different translations, which include not just the word island, but promontory, peninsula, coast, and even describes land within a continent that is surrounded by lakes, rivers, or streams, which would be a completely appropriate word to describe the Wishot structure at that time. 
When you add all of these details that I've shared throughout this video together, I'd say that the Pomponius Mea map is probably the least compelling part, as it may just be talking about the Atlas people who lived under the, the ancient Mauritanian king of the same name. At least, that's how some will come to dismiss this. But then again, it seems to me that the very name Atlas was carried down and reused, just as people do with names today. All I know is that the numerous details shared in this video are too astounding to be ignored. And Atlantis or not, whether it ever existed or whether or not the Rishot structure would be the long lost location, if nothing else, like I said earlier, the Rishot structure should be listed on Natural Wonders of the World. And not only that, the very nature of the Sahara Desert, having clear evidence that the ocean blasted over it far more recently than 56 to 66 million years ago, should be a topic that is front and center among researchers, scientists, climate scientists, and everybody. Geologists, this is significant. So I know some people will dismiss the possibility of Atlantis and ridicule the Rishot theory. Great. But like, we need to talk about the science aspect of this and what the heck happened to the Sahara Desert. Now I must share something that I am incredibly- So anyways, we'll, we'll move on from here. This is, that was the end of the video. So David, in your, in your thoughts on all of this, what are your thoughts when when viewing this possible location. I know when I saw it, I was pretty blown away. I thought, wow, this this might actually be it, you know, out of all the things I've seen. I'm deeply impressed. I give the guy an A+. Plus. It's an extremely compelling argument. The visual is so striking. Um, from having uh, read about Atlantis and looked at a lot of artists' conceptions of what Atlantis would look like, I mean, that's it. I mean, yeah. you just see that. And that's a stunning visual right there in the desert with the evidence of the, uh, you know, the sea fossils and everything. I said it's the most compelling argument I've ever seen. Very much so. And I've never, you know, I never actually looked at the top of the Sahara like that and seen what he pointed out where it's very clear that a water came right over the top of that especially in that volcano area where it washed away a lot of the volcanic ash and stuff that rocked there that's pretty amazing to me that 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 took place right there i mean that is uh, that's something that i never heard of nor thought of and I, I i actually didn't realize that africa was lush that short of time ago yeah you know and of course i didn't i don't believe in 65 million old earth and i don't mm -hmm. believe in the earth spinning and tilting and all that i believe in a uh, the structure that the bible describes as our earth but the the destruction of civilizations that got too advanced is a common theme throughout all of history. We see it in Babylon. We see it in Tyre. We see it in, um, I mean, we, we've even seen it in America, right? We've seen maybe not through water destruction, but we've seen entire civilizations wiped out. We have remnants of this in civilizations that are ancient here in our, here in our country that nobody seems to understand what's going on and our government's covering up. Um, this is all over the world. This is amazing. Yeah, and there are, it's also amazing that uh, there at the Great Pyramid, they've found boats. Yeah. Now, you know, that's kind of uh, a clue there. Uh, but also there's a fellow by the name of Robert Bavall that has done a lot of work and research on the pyramid. And he claims, as many other researchers have agreed, that the, the alignment of the pyramid with the the belt of orion it's like a clock and that it's pointing to a date they claim of about eleven thousand bc mm. that this could be pointing to the date of this cataclysm interesting and that perhaps that the um pyramid was built right after that time and with the boats there of the people you know trying to protect themselves from another cataclysm yeah so I don't know. It's another very compelling theory, but uh, one thing <laughs> that is to me is obvious that what people are being told in their secular institutions, they're being lied to. Yeah. They're being lied to big time. And the people that are constructing these scenarios, they know that the evidence is against them yeah. in so many ways and so many areas that it's it's just refreshing when you come to the place where you stop trusting these people because yeah. you're not going to get the truth from them and a question i've asked myself and a lot of people have asked me and you probably many times and i'm going to ask you this just because i want to get get your thoughts on this what is the reason why what is the motivation mm -hmm. for the suppression of this knowledge in your opinion 
Well, I think that they're going to bring things around. They want the idea of this millions and millions and millions of years ago, this ancient earth that was created by the aliens, and they're going to come back, and here's our ancient creators. I think this could very well be where it's going, yeah. uh, this um, alien disclosure thing. I think so, too. You know, we, we talked about enchantments in one of the shows we did and how in order for an enchantment to work, they have to change the idea of who you are. They have to have change your identity. They have to change your past and, and make you believe that that's who you are. And, of course, we know this. This is, a, this is another rabbit hole, but, you know, Hollywood has been the tool of these uh, wizards for a long time. The, the term Hollywood, for instance, the, in Wan lore, in the Druidism, Hollywood from the Holly Tree made the perfect wand that was the wand that they used and they're using yeah. it to um compose everything that's going on your your reality our reality our enchantment and only a certain amount of people have been able to to see past that and i believe that's a biblical thing where god gives the yeah. gives you the ability to have your blindfold removed moved to this world but the the reality is we are under an enchantment and part of that enchantment i believe is falling apart right now to where either the world's going to accept the deceit deceit or they're going to accept the reality. I believe that's happening as we speak. I do too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I I think it's only a matter of time. Um, you know, we see all the signs with um, the, all this disclosure coming forth. I mean, it's really hard for people to hide the things that they used to hide with all the technology we have today, with cameras everywhere, with um, being able to, you know, save data on people, uh, intelligence, the, the intelligence level that we're operating at because of technocrats and because of, you know, things like Facebook, Google, all of these organizations that are an eye to all of the people. You know, obviously Satan is the ultimate intelligence officer. He's the abbas, he's the one that goes and accuses everybody. He's gathering intelligence on the entire world right now. This is his his mode of operation. And um, it's it's pretty amazing the the idea of what we're living in. But I think helping people to understand the enchantment is a great way for them to see past it like we talked about before in magician's trick and when you see the trick mm -hmm. it seems really amazing but when you understand how it works it doesn't seem quite so amazing it just seems like a cool trick right well yeah. that's what hopefully we're trying to do with this information like tonight even though this is just you know about it is very to me it's significant i think it's interesting uh to other people it's going to be interesting as well but the whole point of uh shows like this is to pull the wool so to yeah. speak out yeah. and show people the trick of the magician so yeah and uh, that one fellow there by this gentleman there, that's Graham Hancock, who we've referenced a couple times. And you could call these people truthers, yes. you know, kind of like, you know, back in the day, there was the 9-11 truthers and the conspiracy truthers and all of this. And if a person is not even a, a believer, if they just look at the evidence, they know they can see that the lies are huge that yes. we're being told. And what we're seeing happening and these people are playing a good role. They're, they're presenting evidence that's showing what we've been told is not true. And hopefully what we can do is bring people back to the Word of God where everything is going to make sense yes. when they look at what Scripture says and understand that we've got it all right here. There's some amazing texts. Um, it talks about uh, Tyre just sinking, which yes. cannot be the Tyre of Scripture just absolutely sinking. Yeah. And there's a lot, so many things in Scripture we've talked about on a lot of other shows yeah, that uh, just the, give so much weight to to put a picture of what actually happened. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be the exactly what happens to all these civilizations. They just they come to this huge point of power and um, mm -hmm. integ integration and to a point of just, uh, usually it turns into depravity. I mean, we see what's happening with the leaders and, in our world right now, you know, we're just bringing back something that people may have forgot about, but the Epstein thing showed so much about how our leaders are are literally preying upon the humans in our society, preying oh, upon them. Oh my goodness! Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's uh, disgusting to see that that kind of stuff is going on, but um, this is this is just the reality we live in, man. I mean, yeah. Um, and the. Uh, Henry Morris, who was the father of creation science, in the Genesis record, uh, he said that, and he was calculating this because of the gaps in the genealogies, Bishop Usher did a great job, fantastic yeah. job. Yeah. 
But Morris makes a great case that he did not consider specific gaps in the genealogy that he said could push the date for the Garden of Eden back possibly to nine to 10,000 BC. Yeah. And that would be very much in the ballpark of what uh, Hancock and these other fellows are coming up for an 11,000 BC cataclysm. Yeah. And of course, that's not even to talk about the uh, pre Adamite concept of this, which is beyond our purview. But yeah, this is, uh, you can begin to see a. Uh, um, and increasingly, uh, the waters are getting less muddy the more you look at it to yeah. get a picture of what actually happened. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's, that's so true. And I'm thankful that we're able to see these things. And we, even though we don't really deserve, you know, David, to see the, what we're seeing, it's just, you know, it's such a thing to be grateful for that God is opening our eyes, but also all of you listening yeah. tonight, he, your eyes are being opened to this, which is, you can't say that for at least two thirds of the population of the world, completely under a mind control spell, completely yeah. under an enchantment. Yeah. And so we should be grateful, not lofty because of our knowledge, but grateful that God has seen fit to allow us to see um, the enchantment for what it is, see the illusion for what it is. I mean, everything in our world is an illusion. The money we use is paper. It's like, it's worthless, right? We use it everywhere. We use, and, and people, some people die for it, live, do everything for it, but it's just, it's an illusion. And once we can see past these things, man, it just creates a beautiful uh, path for us to walk on. And it's gonna be, it's interesting because, you know, I was talking to my wife about this today because we were talking about, uh, she was telling me about, because she's going through the entire Bible with like a study group. And they were in the in the part where um, Lot's wife, I can't remember, Sarah is her name, right? No, not Sarah, Lot's wife, um, I can't ever remember her name. She turns around and, and the pillar turns into a pillar of salt. And the idea that she looks back on the city, probably loves the city, they, mo they picked that area with the city. You know, Lot did when the Abraham said, look, you choose here, you choose there. Lot and his family chose that area, the city life, they chose all that. And she had this desire to see the city i guess you know look back and just look back on it and i think about that in america for instance you know there's going to be a lot of people that are praying so hard for america to be restored praying so hard for this and happen that they're going to look back on what is going on here and, and they're going to they're going to hope for america they're going to hope for this atlantis again right they're going to hope for this civilization not realizing that this civilization has pretty much poked god's eye over and over again by the murder of the innocent, by the children oh, being yeah. trafficked, by all of yeah. the, the idolatry that's in our country. Um, they're looking back on this country with, with uh, sympathetic eyes and, and all of this. And this is the same kind of story with Atlantis. There's people looking back on it with sympathetic eyes, just, just like in the study we did with the Anakim and the Anunnaki. They were looking back pre-flood with sympathetic eyes, trying to get back to that time when they could have their 10 rulers back, when they could storm mm -hmm. the throne room of God and and take over and, and we're seeing it play out so strong right now oh we sure are and it's reminiscent of had the uh, the text from plato that talked about in one day and one night it was gone yeah and the book of revelation talks about babylon the great in one hour the yeah. destruction has come yeah and um a lot a very strong case can be made that Babylon the Great, Revelation 18, sounds a lot like New York City. Yeah. And, um, you yeah. know, well, and to, to just think about, you know, the, the corollary there with Lot's wife, you know, the impact that would have for that just to go away. Yeah. Um, In that quick of time, yeah. you know, just yeah. everything that you thought you knew, just yeah. boom, gone. Yeah. Man. What a what an amazing thought because that could happen. That this, the Bible says it's going to happen. This is going to come upon us like a thief in the night. It says right this this destruction is just going to come like that, man. Like and there's no time to prepare for it. Um, you know, before I was a believer, I had this dream, and I don't think it was a prophetic dream, but it was a dream to wake me up. You know, during the time when I had it, you know, the whole world was being destroyed in this dream that I had, and all I could think about was these verses in Revelation that my you know my parents and my teachers and all that had told me about in the Bible about the sky rolling up like a scroll and everything just kind of yeah. like going down at once. And all I could think about in the dream was this. And I remember, you know, thinking I need to grab my Bible. I need to read. I need to know what's going on. And by the time I grabbed it, it was too late. Right. It, I, it was, there was 
there was no time to prepare. It was, that was it. You know, I think that's what the Bible talks about too. And having the oil, the virgins with the oil prepared there, they know it's coming, right? That's yeah. not going to take them by yeah. surprise. It's going to yeah. be here and they're going to see it coming. But, um, in that time, in that dream, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't, I wasn't ready. It was too late by the time I, I didn't even have a chance to repent, to pray out to God in that dream. And I, and I, and I hope that a lot of you guys take the, take what we're saying here and, and really think about, you know, you got, you have a decision to make, you have a decision to make today. I believe you have a decision to make the path toward life or the path toward death. And don't wait too long to make that decision because I'm telling you right now, um, it may come a time when you don't have the chance to make that decision. It'll be way too late. Yeah, it is uh, certainly the case. We might have a little bit of predictive programming in the original Planet of the Apes movie with Charlton Heston when he was walking into the ruins of the old city and he looks over and he sees the decapitated head of the Statue of Liberty. You know, yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah, I, I I'm looking forward to that day. Honestly, it's weird yeah. to say that, but I am looking well, forward to the day when all the idols are are taken out. Yeah. Well, you know, I said the other uh, a couple Fridays ago, I was just so grieved that the politicians are not going to stop the child trafficking and the child recruitment. Uh, it's not going to stop. And the only thing that's going to stop it is the judgment of God. Yeah. And I would rather see the judgment of God put an end to that yes. than for that to continue. I really would. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, God's blessings are, are amazing. And I be feel, I believe that our country has been blessed above and beyond probably any civilization that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And there's no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah. But I believe we're living off the blessings of those that came before us. And it's time, you know, even in the Bible, there's always this 400-year cycle, it seemed like, to where the people that founded the country were just, you know, believers and, and everything happened good and blessings took place. And then you see this slide that takes place of the people, just the morality of the people just declines so far deep into a hole that that time comes up and boom. And we're looking at 400 years, 1600s are around the time when the when the pilgrims settled uh, the United States, you know, the true believers that before the constitutionalists, before all of the revolutionaries that came over here, before the Freemason uh, 1776, you know, uh, thing happened, there were true believers that lived here on this or on this country that uh, came in here. And a lot of people will down the Puritans 100 percent. And there's a lot of uh, things that they did that were not correct. Of course, you have that with any civilization. No matter what civilization you bring up, no matter a group of people, religious people, you're going to have some people that just take it too far and just go above and beyond what is what is considered loving or or in any way, shape, or form right, right? You have that no matter what. And, of course, now the Puritans are trying to be demonized. I don't know if you've seen, uh, there's a show on Netflix called Wednesday. It's about the Adams family, um, and this girl, the girl Wednesday goes to this school for like people like her, like magic families or whatever. And they live in this, the, the schools in this town of Puritans, it's like a Puritan town to where they still have this Puritan fair that happens every year. And it just really demonizes the Puritans in a way. And this, this is oh, wildly yeah. popular by the way, amongst teenagers. Huh. Uh, but you know, the Puritans were, they were some godly people and we're living off their blessings, I think to this day. And now, now the judgment's pretty ripe. Yeah. 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 We absolutely are. Yep. So with that being said, David, I think we are at a good place to uh, end tonight's broadcast. I'm, I'm really, I just want to say this before we end. I'm just super grateful for all of you that listen and support what we do. We could not nor would not do this without you. This is a, a blessing from God to be able to reach as many people as we have been able to reach. I was looking at our numbers in 2022 and just on YouTube alone, just on Midnight Ride on YouTube alone, uh, we've had over 8 million people have watched our videos this year in 20, wow. well, the what previous year, 2022. That is amazing to what me. What a blessing. It's yeah. just, uh, just, uh, just so thankful. And I believe we're living in the time that the prophet Daniel spoke of when knowledge will be increased. Yes. And the amount of information that just the average person can access and look at. And just last month, we added into our FOJC library, I'd, I'd have to, I don't know, about 20,000 digital copies of books, wow. all kinds of rare books. Yeah. I mean, the stuff you can get, you can get it cheaply, is just phenomenal. Yeah. And stuff like this, uh, people are researching, and they're, the average person 
can research and find out uh, the, the truth about so many things right now that it's just a great time to be able to stand up and preach the gospel. And what a blessing to be able to be a part of a broadcast like the Midnight Ride that can speak Christ into the hearts of people that are searching and looking for answers. It's just a blessing beyond expression. Man, so, so true. And, and you know, the feeling the weight of that, you know, it's just um, knowing that I'm, I'm me, you know, me and you both really, all humans, we're just so um, undeserving of all that we have. And just to be able to be grateful for that and grateful for you guys, it's just amazing. And if you haven't subscribed, if you did like this content, please consider subscribing. Uh, consider hitting the uh, pounding the like button. We do this thing we call the Pounders Pound at the end of our videos where everybody that's watching pounds the like button together. And uh, David, you want to count us off for that? All right. Now let's get that Pounders Pound to rocking tonight. And if you guys don't hit the pound button um, enough, this thing doesn't work, right? So it's, it requires you guys to all hit that like button. We want to feel that vibration to the eye of the Sahara. That's right. So let's rock it. One, two, three, boom. Oh, David, it looks like they failed us this time. Oh, you guys have to do it again. Oh, okay, now. Come right, on now. Come on, guys. Let's, let's get it now. <laughs> One, two, three, three, boom. Yeah, there we go. All now right, we got, we got it that time. Now we got it. Thank you guys so much for viewing tonight. We appreciate you guys. So, so much. I mean, this is, like I said, this is a blessing. So make sure you subscribe. Check out all the content. All the links to our other content is in the description below. Uh, David, why don't you end us out tonight? It is just my great honor once again to be able to speak to the Midnight Ride audience. Uh, it is, is just a blessing. We just love you so much, and we appreciate uh you you going on this journey with us so until next saturday night 10 p.m central high five and good night everybody from the midnight ride and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up rise up